Welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry and pizza is my love language. Today's chat is with animator, writer, producer, development executive, and currently the chief content officer at Ottawa-based Mercury Filmworks, Heath Kenny. His current role at Mercury sees him managing the development team and heading up their content strategy, but in the past he's worked on projects like Robot Boy, The Gorillas Music Videos, and Naughty Toyland Detective. In our chat he's going to share his journey from New Zealand to Canada, as well as exactly how to make the leap from maker to manager. But first, this episode is sponsored by my friends at Cloud Stop Motion, who've created possibly the easiest way to start animating from your phone, tablet, laptop, or desktop in seconds. Simply go to cloudstopmotion.com and click Start Animating. Their software works in any modern browser and your files are instantly saved to the cloud. The best part is that they are completely free to use, up to 500 megabytes of storage, which is actually quite a lot. And they're especially useful if you're teaching a class since you can create an organization account which comes with two gigabytes of free storage as standard and allows the creation of unlimited student groups and profiles, all of whose projects and work you can view for yourself from your admin account. Go to cloudstopmotion.com and I've included a link to that in the description of this podcast. So check that out to see how easy it is to get started now. Okay, without further ado, let's jump in. Hi Heath, how are you? I'm very well, Terry, how are you? I'm very well as well. So uh, why don't we, well, you were just, you know, heading up the Ottawa Animation, heading up the Ottawa Animation Festival. How it was wrapping up the Ottawa Animation Festival that you did all by yourself. <laughs> Don't tell Stephanie, she's going to be very upset. Yeah. So the festival itself was, uh, was great. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I, I love community events, uh, especially animation community events, like things that uh, support the, the community and, and help me, uh, I would say, get to know my local community. And as a new uh, resident of Canada, uh, it's been great that that uh, opportunity for me to connect with people and get to know them and and I think the pitch this thing for us as a company but also me as an individual has been a really great way for me to reach out and get to know the community that I'm now part of. Hey, I mean that's kind of how we met last totally last year through the pitch this competition thing. Like you were super great and supportive in that and here we are talking later and you're on my podcast. What's up? <laughs> that's it. That's how it works. That's it. Community festivals podcast talking anyways yeah well, that's, so that's totally it that's totally it yeah i'm i'm super interested to hear kind of your backstory because you came from new zealand and uh, where there isn't much of a animation scene and you've moved your whole self to canada very recently to pursue animation forever so like tell me how hard was it starting in a country that doesn't have a big industry, lots of networking opportunities, festivals, you know, mentor, like how, how do you even start when you're in a place that doesn't have a supportive industry? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I can't speak to what it's like now, because obviously that was like 100 years ago, because I'm obviously 200 years old. But it, it was, uh, it was like when I was, like it was, I guess it was in the 1990s when I was there. And it was a, uh, yeah, it was a different scene and and there, there wasn't much going on at all. Like since obviously there's Lord of the Rings and Weta and there's lots of CGI stuff happening out there and and you know there's there's more folks doing stuff there now than there ever was, kind of thing. But um when I was starting out, there really wasn't much. So I remember when I was leaving school, I was told that animation wasn't a real job and it's done in Asia and it's not done in like there's no way I could do it in New Zealand and you know, cartoons kind of magically appear on the screen and like, who knows how they get made. So I actually, I did a whole other job career path thing for four or five years after leaving New Zealand, uh, sorry, leaving school. And then, and then I, uh, I sort of was encouraged by my, when I was doing my apprenticeship as a, as a cabinet maker, I was encouraged by my um, teacher uh, to, to take a shot. He was like, well, now it's now and ever you're young enough, just go for it. So I wait, wait, so you're making cabinets for like five years doing this apprenticeship and you're like woodworking cabinet teacher is like, listen, you're great at cabinets, but you can't stop talking about animation. So just go do it. Like, is that, yep. is that That's what? It. So you That's were, you were like pretty at it. You were like, uh, like talking about it all enough and trying it out that people were noticing. Yeah, 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 no, I was, I was like, uh, you know, it's kind of, I guess they, it, people call it a side hustle now, but it wasn't that, it wasn't that uh, organized or, or calculated. I was just kind of doing it because that's what I like to do. And so I was like, 
I was always drawing comic books and just trying to figure out how to do things. I think I even had a published comic book at one point for a surf magazine or something. And, and I was just kind of doing stuff all the time. And then, yeah. And then my, my, I think his name was Andrew Porson. It seems like so long ago now who, who, who was just a super nerd of like cabinetry, cabinet making and woodworking. And he just taught me so much stuff about process and how to understand you know, the, the, the correct way to go about manufacturing something like whatever it is. So, you know, being all super creative up front and then being super disciplined down the line as you went to executing on a, on a, on a wacky whimsical idea. And so he like taught me more line already. <laughs> That's it. He taught me more about creativity, I think, than, than I've ever learned from an animation school. Um, anyway, oh, wow. so now so we... your, your animation schooling was cabinetry. <laughs> pretty much pretty much I mean, it's weird but it's true uh anyway so i went to uh i went to animation school I, I took a bit the bullet sort of sold everything i owned my car my surfboards everything and i and i paid for my first year of animation school which was terrifying and i you know burnt loads of bridges and off i went because i was like i had to make sure i couldn't turn around and come back because it was too easy to come back to the safety of what i knew and so i was like i need to jump in there you know fully wow. committed and then, um, yeah, I, I went into animation school and it was terrifying and I felt totally, you imagine coming from a construction site to going into an animation school is like such a culture shock for me. I was totally lost. It was probably more of a culture shock doing that, going from a small town of 20,000 people to an animation school in, in, a, in Auckland City, which is 1 million people. Um, it's more of a culture shock doing that than it was going from Auckland to London. Wow. What? That's crazy. That's totally crazy. So you're, you're already an adult working in the industry for every years, and then you sold everything you had, burned your bridges on purpose so you, you couldn't go back. You're like, all of my eggs are in this one basket. Yep. And what, what, what was that like? What, what did it feel like to do that? Like, what, you know, like, there's a moment where you're like, I have to sell everything I have to make this happen. Like, I have to start fresh from everything I've built. I was totally absurd. I mean, I got into a huge argument with my, with my father at the time. He was like, there's no way you can do this. This is absurd. He was a carpenter. So he, there's no way he understood anything uh, that was going on. And, and, you know, and also, you know, very physical man, you know, uh, he wasn't afraid of getting into it as it were. And so he was just like, this is not possible. You can't do this. And so it was, it felt very much like a rebellious act, you know, in every yeah. way, every way you can think of. Wow. So you, so like, what gave you the confidence to go all in then? Because like, you're going against your family, everything you've known, you know, you're like starting fresh into the big unknown where you don't even know if you're going to succeed or fail. Um, I think it was the, I don't know if it was confidence to be honest. I think it was the fear of not doing it. I, I remember, I remember distinctly looking around and, you know, apart from Andrew, who was my, my mentor at the time, which I didn't realize how, what, what, how much of a special man he was. Um, but looking around, I was like, I don't want to be in this place and be stuck in this this job, right? Um, yeah. I feel like the 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 lane's too narrow, and and I, you know, I want to be a creative person. I remember with Andrew, everything seemed possible, and then with everyone else, nothing seemed possible. It was like you're making boxes and simple geometrical shapes, you know. And and also, I could see. I could see the, the sort of end of what we were doing coming through automation. I could see that the industry was going to change rapidly. And, you know, that was before IKEA, you know, it wasn't really a thing then. So automation was coming and we weren't going to be so relevant anymore as well. So yeah. I just had the, the fear of staying still felt like death to me somehow. I felt like I needed to go and try it. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, how does it feel now coming so far? You know, you've done it all. You're in different, you're in a totally different part of the world, complete opposite side of the world do it you've done it all you know animation directing etc like how does it how does it feel now that you just told me that you gave up everything at one point in your life and basically said like i have to start fresh and do this and now you've done it like how does that feel um I, well it feels like some things never change as how it feels it feels it feels like if you if you i think if you're looking for genuine growth i think you have to step into those uncomfortable areas of your life and yeah. You know, it's it's. I think that's the truth of it. Is that it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. Um, we all have like work to do on ourselves, and I think that the the most valuable stuff is when you you know, step into those areas of un where you're not comfortable and you're and you need to grow and, and change, right? And so I think that if anything, it's given me the courage to do that stuff. You know, yeah, to absolutely. to sort of look at something and say, okay, yeah, I'm afraid of that, or I'm nervous of that about that, or I'm apprehensive at least. And, um, and then kind of look at it and say, well, that's not a reason not to do it. Right. And you have this reference point in your mind that you yeah. 
did it at one point when you know the stakes weren't high were the highest um have you ever felt that feeling again where if you stay put you know it's you're afraid to stay where you are and you have to push yourself to to move on or move to somewhere else like i know you've traveled to different countries and taken on different positions and whatnot has that feeling that you had back then in carpentry ever come back in animation yeah, I think it, as soon as you start to feel comfortable and like you you become you've got some level of expertise, I think it's it sneaks in, right? It sneaks in, and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, I'm feeling comfortable, confident, I know what I'm doing, and then change obviously is inevitable. And we we work in an industry that's constantly changing, and I think that you have to be ready to um, you have to be ready to move and, and make those changes, whether it's move geographically or move laterally within the same company you're in, or even just move internally with what you're comfortable doing. Um, I think you. Well, my personal point of view is you should embrace change and you should look, you should look for it. I know that's not everybody's, but I think that, you know, since I made a you know conscious choice to get involved in, in development specifically and that you can't survive, I don't believe in development unless you have a growth mindset and you're willing to change constantly and also constantly question what you believe. Well, okay. So I, I get that from like a theological standpoint, but what you just said in development, what, from a practical standpoint, what do you mean? Do you have to change constantly and, and like believe in it? Well, like the, uh, the, the world is changing, right? All the time around us. And, and what was acceptable once upon a time is not acceptable now. What, what the marketplace is looking for now is maybe not what it'll be looking for tomorrow um, because animation takes so long to develop or to produce. Um, you have to be kind of looking ahead and, and seeking you know, change, opportunities to change and do things differently and, and new voices, new stories to tell. And they don't look like anything that was here yesterday, you know? And, and I think that's the thing that someone once said to me, uh, you know, was that, you know, if we were to ve develop SpongeBob today, it would not look like SpongeBob. Yeah, totally. So like, um, what are, I guess, maybe like three things you do to constantly keep yourself on your toes? Like, I think you mentioned one where it's like, look for new creators, or like uh, voices or whatnot, like, you know, that keep you going fresh? Um, yeah, definitely. Like, I think engaging with like a, a, a diverse uh, group of like creative people, I think is, uh, uh, is one thing for sure. Um, one thing I've learned through, through training as a, as a facilitator is to embrace the critical voices. Like, don't shy away from those that have critical things to say. Like, that's actually a really informative piece of the puzzle. Um, and, you know, I know that people talk about setting yourself up for success, and I think that is important, but I, I would say also set yourself up to fail safely. That's the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, one more question on this tangent. Um, you know, you said, say, say I'm like sitting in my job right now and I'm feeling really comfy and I'm feeling like I need a change. How would, how would I go about doing that? Do I like specifically look for opportunities that I feel are uncomfortable? Do I wait for something to come my way? Am I like constantly on the hunt for like, you know, I'm maybe like a senior animator, like, I don't know where to go. Should I start trying to get into directing or management? Like, how do, how do I, how do I make sure that I'm evolving when I feel I'm ready? Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. And I think that's a question that, that a lot of people can relate to. I think the, the thing I try and you know, sort of share with everybody in terms of my personal experience is that um, I think it's good to have lofty goals, but I think you need pragmatic plans to, to go along with those lofty goals. So, so if we look Sounds at like a like, book, lofty goals and pragmatic plans. Yeah, exactly. Like right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like a $3 self-help book. Anyway. So um, it's, it's, if you, if you're looking at a large goal, right, which I think you should, and you, you, and you should say, why not me instead of like, that can't be me. You should say, well, why not me? And if it was me, how would I go about that? So then, you know, uh, look at your lofty goal and then, and then walk backwards to where you are today and then concentrate on, on the next first steps. Like, okay, what is the, what is the, and, and that plan I just mapped out, uh, what is the first step? So maybe the first step is going to see my supervisor and asking for a performance review, or maybe it is, um, literally asking for what I want. Maybe it's like setting up a meeting to ask for it, right? But whatever that first step is, um, you need some some steps. You need some first steps. And then I think the idea is like, see every step like a learning mission. I'm, I'm seeking information. So what I want to do is if the response is, well, you know, you can't be a director today because you are a background designer. And it's like, okay, but if I was to be a director, what would I need to do? Yeah. What, what, what are the skills I'm missing? What do I need to do? For example, um, 
there was a, a background designer that I worked with on Robot Boy season two. Um, and he subsequently worked with me on a bunch of different things. And uh, he said to me, I want to be a director. And I said, well, you know, because you come from background, you have really strong layout skills. Like you can really like compose a shot very, very well. I said, well, what you're missing is, you know, character posing and ability to draw characters. I said, because if you can do that, then you can start storyboarding. And if you can start storyboarding, you can start telling stories. And if you can start telling stories and you're starting to become a director. So how about we step it back like that? And then let's start with the first step. And I gave him a whole bunch of books and he took them all, photocopied them, started working on character posing and kept sharing it with me. Um, and then I got him his first storyboarding gig where he worked as a, uh, um, a fixer, like someone doing uh, uh, basically cleans and fixing on, uh, and punch-ups on, on storyboard sequences. And then he got his first storyboard to do on a show that he was actually supervising the background. So I asked the production manager if, you could, if they could give him a board with a, some extra time and he'll do it in parallel with what he's currently doing as a, as a layout supervisor because he could do that stuff with his eyes closed, but he could not do the other stuff. So he had a little bit extra time to work on it slowly during the, the sort of series schedule. And then, but he got to complete his first 11 minute board. And then he learned a lot from doing that. And, you know, long story short, he got to direct his first uh, uh, short development uh, episode, uh, like teaser thing. Uh, with me and then he actually directed his first show which was for good morning it was called um Baron sebastian and his name is Lionel francois and he's top wow. top man what an incredible story podcast over i feel i feel like <laughs> i feel like that's a great case study example if i ever heard one that's amazing um, and there's but there's tons of them there's tons totally, of them like totally. that and and it's and for me it's like it's about like breaking it down into a into a like okay what are the pragmatic steps and are you willing to are you willing to do that? You know, totally. I think the willingness is key because like, for instance, maybe this is like maybe an uncomfortable thing, but uh, maybe he had to take a step down in pay to take a storyboard fixer role when, you know, he knew it was on path to becoming this thing. Not, I'm not saying he did, but to become this thing that he actually wanted down the road. When I think that some people aren't willing to take risks like that to get where they go totally totally and 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 you know he took all kinds of personal risks and you know he spent prolonged periods of time working in development which, which everybody knows is kind of like you know there's stop and start work and it's frustrating and it's you know and and, and i'm sure he said those things that i didn't even know about during that period of time so he could stay doing that work so there we all make personal sacrifices the important thing is that you know it's leading somewhere right you don't want to be doing that in the, in the sort of an abusive relationship which would bring me to my second thing which would be uh, find trustworthy kind of accountability buddies, like people yeah. that you can count on to be honest with you. Um, because that, when, when I was offered the job as, you know, to take over as director on Robot Boy season two, um, I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Like, you know, can I really do this? I I'm, haven't I'm, I'm directed such long format stuff before. And, you know, I spoke to a good friend of mine um, about it. And, and he basically said, look, all these people are, you believe in you they're offering you this job if you don't believe in yourself at least trust them that they see something in you and give yourself the chance yeah yeah totally that's really good advice and it's like you know imposter syndrome is such a big thing in totally. animators mindsets and my mindset etc but it's it's like kind of good to have that in mind you know somebody else is trusting me i'll just let's see what happens i'll do my best <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think as a manager, I think a lot of people need to realize that they, they have that power to, 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 to empower and embolden somebody just by showing them support, showing, look, I believe in you. Even if you don't, I do. I believe in you. You can do this. Nice. Nice. Cool. Um, let's get back to, you know, you know, your journey a little bit more. So you went to animation school. It was a huge culture shock. Yep. Um, then how did you end up in London after school? Yeah. So that's a, uh, kind of a long story but i'll make it short so i left the cause notes yeah exactly left you said you were 200 years old i don't need uh <laughs> exactly i left school prematurely and started uh flux animation with brent chambers brent uh was kind enough to let me sleep in his basement and stay with him to start the studio together which was crazy i mean it was brent's studio but I, you know i was definitely like uh uh jumping at the opportunity to to help start something um 
I bounced around in New Zealand doing animation work on Disney's TV shows and all various other things that were happening at the time. They were just kind of like trickling in and out of the company, uh, country, sorry. Um, and then I got to a point where I was like, I want to work on films and sort of things with bigger budgets and longer schedules. And so uh, I just decided to bite the bullet and go to London because I saw a Gorillaz music video. Uh, I was sleeping on a friend's couch and I saw, uh, I think it was Tomorrow Comes Today or something like that. And I was like, oh my God, I want to do that. It's like super smart posing, limited animation. These people are onto something. So I left to London and I turned up there and all the work had dried up and there was no jobs. Wow. Great. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, no. So the whole uh, pragmatic plans thing didn't really. <laughs> well, that was not, that was see, see look, yeah, I was, I was young. I wasn't learning much there. So yeah. it wasn't very pragmatic. It was just like, it was a, it was on a whim. I was just like, I'm out of here. So, wow. but that whole but thing. Was... It doesn't sound like you had much tying you to stay in New Zealand, really. You said you were no. hopping around a lot, et cetera. So it sounds like. Yeah. The work was unstable at best. And, and, you know, um, and I was young. I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't really understand anything. So I was like, I was just like, oh, I just like this. I want to try it. And so I was like, I'll give it a go. So I literally like had a backpack full of stuff. And I also lived in an apartment in, in Auckland that had like nine people in it. And, and a lot of them were European, like the majority were European. So I had this little romance about Europe as well. I was like, I got to go to Europe. Europe. It's going to be amazing. And so I, I arrived in London and then it was tough. Like I got off the plane and the exchange rate, had, like the New Zealand dollar, had, like bottomed out. I was like, I think the, the pound was like four times the dollar. So I already lost a bunch of money by the time I left New Zealand and arrived in London. And then, and then no one was hiring. Everyone was like, oh, we only hire people that are, they were literally, the questions were, uh, where have you worked before? Who do you know? And, you know, uh, what's the other one? I can't remember. There's other, another leading question. And my, of course, my answer was no to all of those. So I don't know anybody. I haven't worked anywhere before. Um, I have a real kind of send it in kind of thing. And everyone was like, yeah, send your real in. And then just nothing crickets didn't hear from anybody so it was it was so difficult to get in anywhere and then everyone was like well all the features have left town so all the feature animators are now doing commercials so there's no work in commercials either so there's no work anywhere so uh so it was like oh god what have i done you know and then i, I literally i remember i applied to work in a bar for three pounds an hour i was like oh my god um and then um and I was on 25 New, Do New Zealand dollars a foot when I left, which is just the foot of film. We used to get paid on a foot of film, which is insane. Um, and so, and I, and I arrived in London and I was like, oh God, I'm going to die. This is going to be awful. And then my old teacher from animation school, she was with her boyfriend working at a small studio in London. And she said to me, hey, we're just leaving for Berlin. Uh, they haven't had time to look for anybody. Just go in there now. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. So I called them. And uh, convinced them that I was just around the corner, which I wasn't at all. And then I crossed London to get there and to take my reel in personally, because I realized that no one was looking at them if you sent them in. And, uh, and then, yeah, long story short, Phil Valentine hired me at Espresso Animation and it changed my life. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, like maybe you got to London a little bit early. You could have showed up a few weeks later and still got the same opportunity. But if you didn't, if you didn't go on that whim, then you wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking here. Well, we may be talking just a different, in a different capacity. Totally. And I, but, but I think that, I think that ultimately that's the, that I think that's the big learning for me and all this, even though it was irresponsible, I didn't really have a plan and all that kind of stuff. I certainly didn't do enough research, but, um, but the truth of it is, is if you wait for the perfect sort of wave to come your way, if you sit on the beach and wait for the perfect wave, by the time you paddle out there to wherever the wave is, you have missed it. You've missed it. You're too late. You've got to be out there swimming around in the muck with everybody else for opportunities to come. And if you don't take that risk of failure, then nothing will ever happen. Totally. Totally. Wow. That's, that's getting my wheels turning. That's interesting. So, okay. So you're in London for a while. How did you get to, uh, you know, tell me, give me the close notes of how that went and how you came to Canada and how you yeah from so so <laughs> yeah quick quick uh quick i guess um milestones would be i uh worked for espresso for many many years phil gave me loads of opportunities i got to shoot some live action in la travel around a bit one of those trips i was in where was i i was in san francisco and i met robert valley who introduced me to Pete Candeland, who was directing Gorillas at the time. And he said, hey, what are you doing? I, was li I said, I live in London. He said, it's me too. What are you doing on Monday? I said, nothing. He said, come into the office. I came to the office, started working on Gorillas. spent a year on Gorillas. During a gap between music videos, a friend of mine, Charlie Bean, gave me an opportunity to do a board on Robot Boy. 
which was being done in Paris. Then he left uh, after season one and said, we need a director. Would you be interested in, in coming over and working with Bob Camp? I was like, great, let's do that. I want to learn about TV. So I came over and worked on that show, uh, which led to me getting my job at Alphanum as a creative director where I set up a de- my first development studio. And then that was bought by Gaumont where I became uh, executive producer and uh, I think creative VP or something. And then I, that's where I expanded the development studio and got to do a co-production with Mercury Filmworks in Canada called Atomic Puppet. And it was thanks to that co-production that I met Chantal Ling and Clint Eland, which led to me getting the current job that I have at Mercury Filmworks chief content officer what a ride what a crazy ride (laughs) it's a bit weird when you say it like that 10 years in the making and it's like 30 seconds to explain (laughs) (laughs) it's completely so okay so tell me what tell me um what a chief content officer does and is that a typical role at a lot of studios yeah i mean i think i think it's um probably not i would say i'd say it's it's somewhat of a luxury to have someone in that role um I think uh, it's it's one of those roles that can kind of mean a lot of things. Like there can be a commercial component. There can be a um, you know, obviously a creative component. I think it's it depends what the studio needs, I guess. And it also depends on the profile of the individual that you hire. So some people you can hire in that role and they, they're they really coming from a commercial background. So they're here to sort of business development, that kind of thing. And other people, they, they can be much more kind of like focused on the creative, like the editorial line of whatever the company's like, doing uh, from a creative standpoint and my current role is both of those things so so i have a commercial component component to it and i also have a creative component and uh so so the the idea is that we are building an, uh, an additional piece to this company's kind of puzzle we're, we're adding on to what is already here um mercury is is a company built on uh, technical excellence they've done uh, uh, some of the most amazing 2D animation I think that there is in the industry. I've always been a huge fan, and to 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 join the company and have the opportunity to build something alongside that is is remarkable and and really quite amazing. And the goal is to try and shape a place where we can start telling our own stories and build a, a genuine originals department um, and start to create uh, our own intellectual property that we can then you know obviously produce, manage, and and you know distribute around the world not that we're building a distribution platform yet but you know right now it's just about creating shows so your uh let me reiterate that back to you your job is twofold one you're developing commercial Mm -hmm. side of the business and commercial you mean like advertisements no in terms of uh, when i say commercial i mean like financial right so and with a with a a goal to sell something right so ultimately there is a like a a commercial quote unquote commercial goal where we're trying to sell a product of some kind right so in this particular case what we're doing is we're trying to develop uh show ideas that will turn into like because like i think in uh, like intellectual property is a a term that's kind of thrown around i think too lightly i mean i think that uh like an i like an idea i have i I have ideas every two minutes you know i have i have so many ideas of boxes full of them but that doesn't make it an intellectual property it makes it an idea that that yeah, that's fine. And that's great. And, you know, I'm sure many people have the same or similar ideas or maybe better ideas or whatever. But I think once you try and seek to monetize an idea, it becomes, um, becomes something else. And I, and I think that, you know, having worked in France for a long time, I, there is a really, um, I think, fantastic understanding of, of what makes an intellectual property and what like creators rights look like and authors rights and that kind of stuff. But I think it's a whole other subject, but I definitely think I have a deep respect for that. But I just think that if you're talking about Lego as an intellectual property or a, a Marvel character or a, that's one thing, you know, but if you're talking about an individual's idea that they've, they've just come up with and they want to sort of turn it into something, I think that's kind of, that's a different story. And I think that's where we're starting most of the time with something that, you know, doesn't have a lot of notoriety. People don't know about it. It's, it's maybe a fresh idea or maybe it's an idea that's been done a hundred times before, but maybe the, the real interest is, is, finding a fresh way to execute on that idea i don't know but uh but i think that uh, i think an intellectual property is something you build over time yeah. um but you start out with an idea you know and i think that's the that's the thing really i think that the, that for me um what we're trying to do is we're trying to take ideas turn them into compelling stories that people can relate to that hopefully will eventually turn into an intellectual property of some value yeah totally and so that's one side and the other side is developing 
sounds very similar. You're developing your own IPs to produce yourselves. Yeah, no. So, so I think that the, the one side is the commercial side of that, which is everything we just talked about. Yeah. The other side of it is, is about building process. So, uh, and building an environment uh, within which people can be creative. Right. Mm -hmm. And also influencing the editorial, um, let's say style of the, how the company expresses itself. Right. And so I think to, in order to do that correctly, you, you have to spend a lot of time listening to, to the people that make, make up the company. And, and also I think you have to, you know, take it slow. You have to figure out, okay, well, how are we going to work together? And, you know, how can I be of service to, to this community and this company and, and try and find a way that we can express ourselves creatively. That's not only safe, but also uh, I think unique to us. Amazing. So maybe I'm projecting, correct me if I'm wrong. I love this idea from what I get from it, but you're trying to say, you know, we have however many employees yeah. uh, and they all have creative visions and they'll work on stuff for us every single day. How can we turn, you know, their uh, personal aspirations and creative visions into this um, and create a process to draw those in and actually make them happen through this company and, and for them yep. to be a part of that? That's definitely part of it. And I think that, I think that um, let's say that would be a side effect of a healthy creative environment. Like, yeah. I think, I think that, that not all, you know, artists are storytellers and not all totally, like, totally. like, like folks that want to be like, I think there's a big difference between an expert in the field and being creative. You don't have to be like the world's best animator to tell a great story you, or to tell a great story. Sorry. You don't, you don't have to be the world's best drafts person to illustrate a children's book. You don't have to be, um, you know, the, the best songwriter to be a great singer, you know, or vice versa. So I think that you, you, I think the first thing you need to do in my experience is again, to focus on, which has become very much my mission in the way I go about doing things, um, is to create a safe place to be creative and then a creative place to do business. And that's what I'm doing. So are, are there any other examples of studios you can think of that have a well-oiled machine revolving around this? Content? I mean, honestly, I don't really know many, um, but, but again, I haven't really worked in that many studios like outside of, uh, of well, because I spent so much time at Gomo. Totally, right? because so, like, you know, I've, I've talked to quite a number of studios through this podcast and I'm like doing research all the time. And this sounds amazing. Like, you know, there's there's like a typical like studio owner wants to develop their own IP and right. they like, uh, you know, they do and they get everybody at the studio to do that or there's a studio that buys ips from other creators and then you know etc but i love this like kind of homegrown uh like create from within kind of atmosphere how do you okay so maybe this segues into something i want to talk about which you recently did and recently released on youtube and i've watched them and they're amazing how do you actually practically integrate that into studio life because you know you're you've got this pipeline you've got deadlines uh, you know, you've got all these shows to produce and, and create. How do you make time to also do this without, you know, running everybody dry or working overtime or getting all of your projects done and doing this at the same time? Yeah, I mean, there are great questions. There's a lot of questions in there. Uh, there are great questions, but I think that if I was to, uh, I guess that this, I'm going to try and give you a simple answer to a complex thing. So I think that the, the simplest approach for me is, again, first of all, what I had to do was get to know the studio, right? So I had to understand how the studio works, how, how things function from, from accounting through to, you know, editing or, or, you know, all the different stages of production, get to know the, um, you know, our line producers, our, our production managers and see what their pain points are and what they're struggling with, how, you know, what does quota look like? How do people, you know, what does an average animator's day look like? You know, how do our art directors work? I had to get, I had to learn all that stuff, right? Because it's specific to studios, right? Each studio is specific. Um, and then based on that, then I had to figure out, okay, what, is, what does a process look like that allows us to collaborate with the rest of the studio in a constructive way? Um, because ultimately we don't want to be, we don't, we don't want to be doing something that disserves the studio. And we certainly don't want to be doing something that's disruptive to everyone's day to day kind of workload, right? So, um, so we have to be doing it responsibly and we have to take, you know, the, the steps we need to make sure that it's, that it's structured and we have a process in, in place. So um, to your point about the shorts that were just released, the, 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 the studio was uh, setting up different ways to engage with the, with, with, the, with the community, right? And so one of the ways that our CEO, Clint Eland, has these Wednesday morning meetings with 15 people at a time with a goal to get through the entire company, right? And then start again. So the idea is to 
is to connect with people on a regular basis and just you know have an open discussion here from them and so one of the things that kept coming out was this idea of like when is the company going to do shorts some kind of shorts program and my question was, was always why would we do shorts like what is the goal i think it has to be super clear because if it's a, if it's some kind of prestige thing or or, or money making exercise or whatever it is then 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 it becomes a whole other managerial challenge, right? Like if it's if it's like the Pixar shorts or, or the Disney shorts, where it's like it's this huge budget and it's like you know requires its its own production team and it requires all kinds of other things, um, then that's that's one you know case in point. But then there's there's other there's different. I know Tip Mouse do a thirty second animation thing on a Fridays, I think. I'm not quite sure how it works, but I know they do something. And I there's lots of shows that do different things. So. My question was just like, what was that? What what would ours look like, and what would be the point of it? And so I just looked at it from a point of view of like, okay, if I was animating here, like I used to animate on on Disney shows back in the day, I was, and you know, I think it's the it's that the monotony of of the sort of um, Groundhog Day effect of animating anything, it's like because in animation is long and it takes a long time and you, every day starts to look the same and you're working away. And so I was like, well, we should offer something where people get to take a break. So they get to take a mental break. They get to take a break where they can just make something for themselves. And we don't own it. It's nothing to do with us. We're just providing the space for them to be able to do that. So what would the cadence look like for that? What would the scope of work look like? And how would we manage it? And that was our focus. And then the idea was to create an opportunity for people to take some time during uh, work hours, during office hours, where they could focus on something that they wanted to make. Of course, one of the biggest errors that I think we all make when we start anything is we we over we underestimate the amount of work and we're overly optimistic. So I think the first round, I think one of the biggest takeaways for everyone is like do something simple. And I think everyone tried to do something way more complex than perhaps they should have. Um, we obviously jumped in and see if we could help to get them through it. The most important thing that came out of it is that they've all made something and they all felt what it feels like to have that weight, the weight of making something, the weight of telling a story, the weight of trying to do something. So it, again, it comes back to that idea of creating a safe place for people to experiment, to try things out, to see how it feels. And then ultimately, if out of that, someone stands up and says, hey, I, I love that. It feels like this is what I've always wanted to do and I want to do more of it. Well, then we start to identify those that can become the storytellers that we are developing things moving forward. But Again, it, it's not like it's some kind of like, okay, if I do this, then this will lead to this, and then this will lead to that, and then this, you know, it's it's not that easy and it's not that linear. But I do think you just have to create a lot of different opportunities in the company where where people can reveal themselves as like, okay, I'm ready, I want to I want to take this opportunity, and then it's up to you to create those opportunities. Nice. So uh, this is amazing, and I love this, and I love that you know Mercury is also allowing this to happen and wants this to happen. How many people ended up participating? uh like percentage wise like 10 percent, 100 percent. like did everybody jump on this uh so we opened it up to the studio um i don't know exactly how many submissions we got but what we um i think it was like 15 so uh, you know 15 submissions maybe a little bit more uh, but it was lots of different different varying types of submissions and then out of that we were aiming to select five right so we had to we want to do five at a time but then of course those folks um, knew that the votes that weren't accepted, they they knew that there was going to be another round coming up in October. So the folks that didn't get accepted, they weren't working on the accepted no. ones? They were, no. okay, so they're just like, sorry, you didn't. Uh... It's an individual shorts program, yeah. So sorry, you didn't make it this time around. Um, there's going to be another selection, but there's varying reasons as well why people may not have been selected um, because that's the other thing. So we're trying to collaborate with the rest of the studio. So we always reach out to, to the production manager as well to see like, you know, uh, how are things going on your deliveries? Uh, would this be disruptive if we took this person out for these number of days, whatever it is, and they came to work with us for a while and did the yeah, short yeah, thing. Yeah. And so sometimes it's like, oh, you know what? All four of those people are coming from one team and they're like, you can't do this. <laughs> just too many people at once. So, so sometimes it's like, well, you know, have to wait for the next round so we can sort of share the load a little bit. But anyway, there's lots of logistical things that we just have to try and figure out. So, so that, again, everybody's taken care of because again, it's a team sport, even though... Um, we may be managing these projects directly out of the development department. We're allowed to do this because, you know, other members of other teams are, are, are carrying that weight while those, those folks are, are out. So you had, you had five this, this round and, and um, you know, now that you've finished this, is this something that's going to be integrated uh, forever or yep. test again? Or like, what is the ultimate, you know, if you could turn this into anything that you wanted based on the result you wanted, what would this be and look like? Yeah, so the I mean the feedback we've we've been getting is that um, you know people want to do more. Um, the 
everyone found it quite difficult, quite challenging. I think that we we need to keep reinforcing um, different skill sets in the studio so that people can do this kind of thing. We've, we've reinvented our training program as well, which we're, we're about to, to sort of roll out in a, probably in January, actually. We're doing our first iteration in November, but we'll tweak it and it'll come out in, in January. But that's another way as well. If you're not fully autonomous in your ability to make a film or create something, the training system that we set up uh, will allow you to sort of do that first. So you can go and learn about builds, or you can go and learn about this, or you can go and learn about that before you get into making your own short. So, so there's going to be different layers to it. But ultimately, I think what would be really great is that um, uh, it builds in popularity. And then I think ultimately it'd be great if we can have maybe a celebratory short where we combine people's talents. You know, maybe they're, you know, maybe the, the everyone that's participated gets together and makes, you know, one big short kind of thing. But I think at some point it would be great if, you know, as we're taking these small steps towards getting confident, um, that that turns into something as well. So I think it'll, like everything, it'll change, it'll evolve, but um, we just got to keep improving our process and the way we manage it and the way we, the way we communicate the expectations as well. You know, I think that the, the constraints themselves are interesting as well. We've tried to really be disciplined about li limiting it to four days, but, you know, some folks really like poured their weekends into it. They did all kinds <laughs> of stuff but, you know, behind the scenes kind of thing, which, you know, it's their prerogative, but it, but it's a lot of work. Like it's a lot of work. So so it's just about you know getting everyone to understand. Like you know, can you do something interesting, but simple? Right. So your idea of also incorporating this is kind of to build up a different kind of atmosphere within the studio itself to to that would draw into those IPs and and the development of things. Well, again, if you if it's one thing to do a short or something like this, but it's another thing to send, find yourself running a show, or yeah, you know, because ultimately we would like our storytellers to be able to run their own shows and, and to, to yeah. lead from the front, right, kind of thing. But but I think it's unfair just to throw someone in there because it's 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 pretty intense. It's it's an intense uh, environment where you're you're getting questions every hour from all kinds of people. You've got to deal with suddenly you've got to deal with networks. There's all kinds of like layers of like communication skills that perhaps you don't have yet and you need to learn when i talk about me coming from a construction site and ending up in an animation studio i literally did not have the vocabulary to communicate with people i just you know i came from a construction monosyllabic construction site you know it's like we're not exactly expressing ourselves in complex ways you know and <laughs> and uh There's five words we use yeah, exactly. Pretty much it. And uh, and so then all of a sudden uh, you have to get nuanced and you have to get, you know, totally, you have to get totally. specific about things and, and change the way you dress people, you know, and, and, and that's, 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 they're learnable skills, you know, but you have to give people the opportunity to do that. And so even this idea of pitch me your little short idea and then work with a team to make it. Uh, and then, you know, and then we'll, I'll try and do a little interview at the end. So it's, all pieces of it are about preparing you for what would come next if you made your own show. Because at some point you'll have to pitch it. At some point you'll have to talk to a client. At some point you'll have to talk about your process, your the way you go about it, brief a team, all that kind of stuff. These are soft skills that we don't get taught. Totally. I love this. It's almost like, you know, I'm maybe like a viz dev person and I never, ever get to dive into this world. And even when I'm at home trying to do it myself, you know, I just, I don't know where to start or like, I don't know these things, but like coming into work and working with the other teammates and consulting with people with a specific directive and having company time to do that is amazing. I love that. Um, so like would a giant success for you, to, it sounds like, you know, one of these creators ends up pitching and, and like show running or just kind of spanning outside of their territory from this project. Um, not even to be honest. I, I feel like if someone comes out of this and they feel energized, they feel re-energized about their job maybe or their even just to get back onto that web comic they've been doing or they get that that boost again it was like oh that thing i put down i haven't looked at it again like that's a success for me right like yeah. if if we get someone to pitch us like quote unquote pitch a show thing or whatever then then that's great too but that's not the goal the guy gotcha. that like again this is about retaining people not rights this is about you know building a culture of empathy as well for people to, to understand each other like well, the way I saw that team bonding and the way I saw that group uh, that was making those first shorts supporting each other, like that's a win for me. Like that's huge. It's just I love huge. That. I love that. So tell me about a little bit more about why you are pursuing this because, you know, you started off as an animator, you know, a creator making things and now you're more of management uh, and building other people up. So when did, when did that change happen? How, and you know, what are, what are your aspirations for taking this path? 
Yeah, so it, I mean, it happened incrementally, like as uh, I think for everybody. But but like the first step was going through uh, that that experience on on Robot Boy, and then just thinking to myself afterwards, hang on, there's things I don't understand about this. Could we not have addressed some of these issues before we started the production? You know, and and then I was like, oh, what's this whole development thing? And then a lot of my friends were were starting in. Uh, in the Cartoon Network Development Studio in London, and we were talking a lot about it. And you know, I even went over there for a while to have a look at it and see, you know, see what was going on. And, and there was some pretty amazing talent there. But but I think that the the main thing was um, I was getting more and more curious about like what do I need to do to become a like a first of all a better director because I felt like obviously directing there's a managerial component. So I was like I need to get better at communicating and expressing myself and. But then when I got into development and I discovered the whole writing aspect of it in, in, in an in-depth way, because I, I dabbled a bit with it, with, with, um, uh, with the writers on Robot Boy. And interestingly enough, they've both gone on to do pretty amazing things. Um, Mike, I think, been, he's been a uh, uh, head writer, even I think he's maybe even producer, exec producer on Loud House Forever and Nick. And like, he's doing amazing things. So uh, Mike Rubina and... So they introduced me to it and they allowed me to dabble in writing a little bit, which is very kind of them. Um, but uh, but when I got into development, I really started to, to see all these other components, you know, it, it, there's the sales aspect of it, the pitching aspect of it, the, 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 obviously the writing, the writing of scripts obviously is one thing, but writing Bibles, writing concepts, writing character descriptions, building characters, building things from nothing. Um, and then obviously creating the artwork that goes with it. But all of that stuff, it was like, oh, there's no school for this. Like, there's no school for this. How do I get better at this? What, you know, what do I have to do? So so that's when it started. And then I got curious about it. And then I started to learn that there were a whole other industries that I didn't know about, like the product design industry, the digital product design industry, sorry, in the UK um, was huge. And us two became a point of reference for me. The first time I visited us two, it just blew my mind. I was like, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. I was like, oh, so this is what they mean when they talk about creative studios. Like this is a creative studio. I've never seen this before. Like, honestly, after going to us two and I came back, to animation studios i was like animation studios look like like literally like factory farms oh no like very uh like I was just, this is making any sense this is making any yeah. sense so yeah 100 totally. yeah, <laughs> so i was like i have to change this somehow i have to try and have a positive influence on this somehow and so um if not for myself then for everybody else you know i have to try and do something and so you know, and, and obviously there were ups and downs and I got disheartened and it was like struggle. It was a struggle for the longest time, for the longest time. I mean, the first time I mentioned a writing room in Paris, because I was like, I want to get people uh, working together and collaborating together. I think uh, I was almost like a, I was almost guillotined. I think it was because it was, I didn't, I was so naive about the, the rights component that went along with that. And, and there was all kinds of like rebellious kind of complaining about that idea, about having people work together. Now it's commonplace, but at the time it was, such a rebellious act everyone was like what the hell are you doing i mean i remember a friend of mine from a network who shall be a name called me and said i got this funny email from the from the writers guild saying that you should be blacklisted what have you done and i was like <laughs> i was like what do you mean wow. what have i done oh, i was totally absurd but i mean there's all kinds of like nonsense like that that went on from for, for all, in all kinds of different areas but but the point is that i was learning and i was under because because again that i was like okay well, what could i have done differently and and how could that have gone better? And and I'm I keep trying to think of like okay what you know what am I naive to? What am I not sort of aware of? What do I need to get better at? And that's that's led me to this place of of accepting the fact that I can get as much satisfaction from being a a, uh, a creative manager as I could once from animating a scene or doing a drawing or you know and also accepting and this is a I don't have you read the Fountainhead? No, I haven't. So there's a book called Fountainhead, and which is a controversial book, but there's two characters in there. There's uh, there's Peter Keating, I think his name is, and Howard Rourke, and it's this idea of this uncompromising creative and this kind of like corporate sellout guy. Um, and there's there's always this question of like who, what profile are you? And and then there's another uh, there's a critic, I think, that's making making this commentary over both of these profiles. But anyway, the critic guy says that you should never pursue your passion because you'll become incredibly unhappy as an as a as a human being you'll always be unhappy right and for me like getting to a place where i can i can really like commit to my day job and really work uh very hard at trying to do a, to, to be the best i can in that job 
and then leave my artwork to my hobby where I can get my personal satisfaction out of it, but not have any commercial entanglement. Like there's something really nice about that. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess I, I don't, I don't have super experience in both worlds, but I can, I can totally see that, you know, as soon as you get commercialism involved in your, in your dreams, it takes, it turns it into something else that, you know, weren't, you weren't intending, I guess. So totally. And I, and I think that being able to keep those two things separate for me anyway, I think it's a, it's, it's actually been a really healthy thing. And I think that it, it there was a, I, even when I, when I, when I finally uh, left Gamal, like Gamal expanded to the point where they, they recruited a new team in Los Angeles and, and um, you know, and Nicola and the team that, that started there were, were incredibly like gentle in that transition. And, and, uh, and, you know, it was a big moment for me where I was like, okay, well, I, you know, what am I going to do? What do I want to do now? When I finally made the, the, the choice to leave, you know, I was very much exhausted after like 10 years of struggle and, uh, or even more. And I was like, well, what am I going to do now? Like, you know, do I go back to directing? Do I go back to like, you know, maybe even like storyboarding on something or whatever, just to get back into like the creative side of things. Cause I was, you know, still always doing it, you know? Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I really had to choose. And I think that was the, the moment that really crystallized everything for me. I was like, okay, no, now that I have the opportunity to choose, I choose the other thing. So could, yeah. because I was like, okay, I kind of like kind of incrementally ended up in this place. And then I was like, but I never chose this because this thing didn't exist when I was dabbling in it. You know, when I was, I was trying to figure it out, the, all, the chief content officer, the VP of creative, that kind of stuff. I, that's not where I started. You know, I ended up there, but I didn't consciously choose it. You know, it was just kind of something that happened over the years. And then, you know, as you're trying to make more of a positive impact, people give you more responsibility and they're like, well, oh, now you can do this and now you can do that. And all this is working to so do more of that. But you're, and you're like, oh, I guess I need to keep doing this because this is where I, where I was heading, right? But when you stop for a minute and then you get to choose, it's interesting what you end up choosing. And, and for me, you know, I don't say it lightly when I say that the mission for me is to create a safe place to be creative and a creative place to do business. I feel like that's going to propel us all forward. I, I love that. Do you ever see yourself um, going back to animation or storyboarding or whatnot? Sure. I think I, I definitely will. I think I'll definitely do it. And I, but I'll, again, I'll probably just do it at home. Totally. I mean, from this chat, you sound like somebody who's very driven by their internal, you know, I don't, I don't know a good way of saying it, but like almost your heart, like even where you ended up now and what you just said to me, where you want to create something that builds up others, essentially, I think that's incredible and amazing. And it, and it sounds like you're exactly you know, with the right studio doing, having the right opportunity to do that right now. How do you see that, you know, say you reach a point um, on your current path where you feel comfortable again, how do you see this kind of uh, aspiration of yours turning into something bigger or uh, in a different path in the rest of your career? You know, like you say you figured out at Mercury Filmworks how to create this internal atmosphere. Uh, is that, is that, uh, fulfilling for you for you know staying in that space or or do you want to turn this into like something bigger change the industry a little bit more i think i think it'll it'll change it'll it'll evolve it'll change it what you know nothing ever stays the same and i think and, and all things being equal i mean for me if if i do my job correctly someone will want my job at some point you know someone will someone will maybe even turn up that's better than me at this job you know <laughs> Yeah. and and the problem will happen you know and there'll be some kind of evolution and it's happened to me a bunch of times before and and it's okay it's totally okay like i i remember a person that worked with me early on at gomor you know she was very frustrated and i couldn't figure out what it was and then we had a meeting we're talking about it and i said oh what you're describing is you want my job like you're just frustrated because you feel like you can do it better than me and you and you want my job which was maybe fair enough because she's a french speaker or you know i wasn't a fluent french speaker i was doing my best but by no means uh, uh, as fluent. And, and, and so I said, well, okay, that sounds like a legit plan. So let's make a plan for how you can get it. I said, but I'm using it right now. So you can't have it today, but. So one well, is murder. <laughs> well, I said, no, I was like, so what you need is you need your, an autonomous project. The, I said, you feel like I'm like some kind of glass ceiling in your way. So let's slip you out from there, uh, like move transversely in the company or horizontally in the company. And then we'll give you your own project where you can shine and you can make a case for taking the job. You know, and when I left, she was the first to take it. You sound like somebody who's able to kind of tap into other people's 
uh, what they desire and their wants and needs and whatever, and kind of help them get there. That's that to me, that sounds incredible. Well, I, I just, you know, I think people have done it for me over the years and, and, uh, and kind of shown me, you know, back to like come full circle back to that apprenticeship, like Andrew, he did it for me, you know, and, and, and maybe that's where, you know, maybe that's where all this comes from, or, or I just felt like he did such an incredible service for me that, um, and also, I think it's not completely altruist. Uh, it's not an altruistic thing because, because it, it also it, it's. I think it's really, really rewarding. You get so much out of it. Like it's addictive. You get so much out of seeing people shine and grow and succeed. And you're just like, you know, I mean, it's not like you. you they didn't need to call it out or whatever. But you just, you just there like, watching it. And you're like, oh man, that's amazing. It just totally came together. The thing we were trying to do, it just, it's come together. And, it, and then it's, I don't know. It's going to sound a little bit like romantic i guess but it's just that whole thing of like maybe not everything's wrong in the world when that kind of happens it's like okay well you know what it's pretty cool i love that and it, well and you have some clear stories i mean you, you, and following up with people that's great so i'm wondering like maybe um looking pat at your whole career in general what are kind of the things that's keeping you going in animation because you started off uh very adamant about uh, getting into animation and having this big dream and then pursuing that and giving up everything a couple times to risk it all and go forward and then, you know, uh, finding your expertise and then moving around, et cetera. Like what is, what has been the underlying thing that's kept you in this industry? Like you can, what you just described to me, you can do in any industry. You can even, you could, doesn't even have to be animation. You could do live action, for instance, if you still want to stay in storytelling or, you know, writing or you could even do it in a cabinetry business go back to your roots you know like what is keeping you here is it familiarity or is it the love of the craft that's a really good question i think that i think that uh and it's something i think about a lot and, and it's funny because i did a whole bunch of training a whole bunch of training i did a, i did a, a fair amount of training and when i was uh um just after go I, I went to berlin to a company called aj and smart shout out to aj and smart they're amazing uh, where I learned all about facilitation and um, design sprints. And I actually have used that a lot in the way I work with artists and development as well. Um, and I have thought about that a lot where I'm like, actually, I think that is like, that's the, it's magical, that whole thing. And I was like, okay, that, and it applies to any industry, right? And once you understand managing the management of creative process, then that creative process, which ultimately for me is finding meaningful problems and trying to solve them, uh, that's pretty much used anywhere. You know, and so I have thought of, I've thought about that a lot, and I think that the 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 answer is simply a I love animation. I think it's it's like a it's a still somewhat young art form, which is you know it's it's growing. I think at an accelerated rate now, thanks to the esport boom and the and the realization that you can tell all kinds of stories with animation and not just like children's stories. Um, so it's definitely growing now more than it ever has, but. But it's uh, it's still a young art form, and there's so much to be done. And as technology grows, I think the stories we can tell will continue to to evolve. So there's that for sure. But then I think the other thing is that it takes a certain kind of person, um, like you, like meeting people like you. For me, it's so fulfilling. Like I love to meet interesting people that you know that I do. They genuinely like uh, move me. Like it's like it's something that makes me feel connected to the world. You know, and I, I that's something I love about it is the people. Amazing. Yeah, totally. And I feel like animators are kind of unique people of totally. many other industries because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, they're doing it from the heart, from their, everybody has a place in their childhood where they saw the magic and they wanted to tell their own stories. And animation is like uh, a really amazing medium that allows people to do that. Uh, that doesn't exist in, you know, there's live action, there's stories and stuff, but animation somehow, you know, you can bring your imagination and make it come to life. Amazing. I don't want to take your whole day. I've super enjoyed chatting with you, but I'm wondering, you know, as we're wrapping up, is there anything that you wanted to share for those mm -hmm. listening to uh, what we've been talking about? <laughs> I guess, the, I guess the one thing is that if you feel stuck, um, yeah, yeah, I just, totally. if, you, if you feel stuck, just, you know, try and ask yourself, you know, a couple of simple questions like, you know, what would it look like if it was simple? Uh, the other question to ask yourself is, um, what can I do with what I have, not what I wish I had? Mm. And then lastly, ask yourself, why not me? Why not now? 
the last one specifically is what really helped drive me into animation myself. I was like, why, why can't I be part of this industry? Like I see other people and like, what do they have that I don't, I don't know. It's just, they're doing it. And I'm, I'm not the second question about what can I do with what I have? Not, I wish I had, is that more about doing like a, a realistic assessment of my current opportunities and skills instead of being like, if only I was uh, really good at, you know, storyboarding, I'd be able to do this versus like, I'm a viz dev artist. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think also a lot of people like they're feeding into Instagram and other kind of platforms like that, that are, that are just feeling, you know, they're feeding into like the best of the best of the best that maybe took 10 years to get there or whatever it is. And they're, they're saying, oh, well, I can't do this thing because I don't have that. Or I can't do, I can't make this film. Or, I can't tell the story because I need to get better at, at viz dev. So I'll do a schoolism course and then I'll, and then I'll wait another three years and then I'll have another look at it. And I can't do this other thing because I need this thing. And oh, now the technology's changed. There's new software I have to learn. And so I can't do totally. that. And so you could do that forever, right? And well, um, as soon as you begin, you're already behind. Like <laughs> Right, 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 right. And I think at some point you just have to get started with whatever it is you have. And, you know, whether it's plastic cups, uh, you know, stop motion plastic cups in a hotel room like I did once or, or <laughs> whatever it is, just like, just get in and make something. Just make yeah. something and then you'll, I guarantee you, you will learn a ton from doing that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I think everybody should watch a plastic cup uh, hotel room and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to include a link to it. I think that's, that's great. Terrifyingly <laughs> embarrassing. But it was no, funny. It is, it's exactly a testament to what you just said, you know, like you're in a situation and you, so I, uh, for those that don't know, you made a stop motion animation using plastic cups. Uh, where you drew the faces on the cups for the expressions. And because you were traveling around a lot at the time, you got the Uber drivers to yeah. do the voices. So you, you literally said like, what do I have access to in yep. these hotel rooms or whatever I am to make an animation? And you like did it. And I think, you know, it's incredible. And you can watch the silly animation and be like, oh my goodness, the voices are actually pretty <laughs> funny. And like the animation <laughs> is pretty good. And like, <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, it was an interesting experience, but but I think it was having done that experiment as well. Uh, you know, it did did prove to myself that you know what, if I, if I if I keep asking myself the question of what does it look like if it's simple, and you know, and I download Vine and I do these little stop motion things with cups and roll up paper faces inside them, okay, it's, it looks kind of shitty, but it's it gets the point across, right? And then you're just trying to demonstrate something that maybe you can do in a much more sophisticated way after you've finished it and you've figured out a whole bunch of stuff about the story, about whatever it is. But, and for me, it's the principle of when we're pitching something as well, I was like, let's pull it together quickly and tell the story and then we'll iterate, right? We'll figure out what worked, what didn't work and we iterate. Totally. I love it. I love it. Any, uh, and so final words are those three questions to ask yourself if you feel stuck, anything else you want to end on? Um, no, just thanks so much for having me. I mean, it's, I think your story is incredible. I don't know if anyone's interviewed you, but they should. Uh, and, <laughs> oh, uh, <thank> <laughs> and, um, uh, big up to silly duck wizard. Love Yay. it. Well, he, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure and I'm so happy we got to do this like full circle thing. It's been a, it's been really fun, like listening to your journey. And I think it's incredible. Some of the, the risks and steps you took to make what you're doing now happen. And, and I really, I think I really feel like internally what you're doing is good. Like I'm very happy about it and, uh, I'm going to take over your job now that I know all about it. So Yay, great. Prepare for that. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. All right. Thanks, Heath. And if you're listening and you want to get in touch or reach out to Heath or follow his work, uh, he's, you can, <laughs> we, we agreed ahead of time that we were going to just say that you should step out of your, your door and like yell his name because he's everywhere. But um, just look him up on the internet. Just type in Heath Kenny and you'll find him. And other than that, uh, check out the description of this video for the link to the paper or the plastic cup animation that he made check that out and that's all for now thank you so much for listening okay bye the music for this podcast was composed by will farmer and the graphics by daniel abensauer i encourage you to look them up if you enjoyed their work